Is that it? Oh, okay, you may all sit down. <laughs> oh, you guys are gonna have to get up anyway, so. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This is the, this is the this is the typo section of the program. We actually reserved it for the wedding pictures. All right, everybody, everybody get up before Francine throws a chair at me. All right, every, sun, every Saturday, I finally get around to uh, 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 getting a scripture out and sending it out to those who I have contact information. Um, and this Sunday was no different. I didn't send it out as much as I, I, I would like to have, but it's found in the book of Matthew, in the 10th chapter, and it's found in verses 29 through 31. Amen. And it's a story, I'm sorry, there you go, I think, there you go. Um, yeah, we're, Murphy's really hot on C Street right now. <laughs> Verses 29 and 31. Uh, so open up your Bibles there in the book of Matthew. One of the Gospels uh, that is found in the New Testament. Now I'm going to read from these verses. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated. For all those that have less hairs than the guy next to you, that's not a problem with God. Amen? Amen? Now, you might be treated unjustly here at C Street or on a job or in your family or even with your pastor. But our Heavenly Father is watching. I mean, don't you know this? When you feel like you're getting uh, ripped on or put down, Remember, your father sees you. Now, Jesus says that even a sparrow falls on the ground. Now, I love this translation because it really boils it down to the equivalence of that time. And back then, you can get a sparrow for a penny. That's the equivalent nature of a sixteenth of a denarius. And a denarius was a day's wage for the poorest of people. In other words, um, it wasn't minimum wage. It was an abusive amount of money that you would take advantage of um, if you were hustling for, for labor. The sparrows were sold very cheaply. In fact, in, in Luke's gospel, Jesus tells us that five sparrows could be bought for two farthings. And they were so common that you got an extra bird thrown in there for free, basically. Here Jesus says the Father sees when even one of these birds fall. Are not you more valuable than they? Now, you have to know that you are. You have to know that you are very valuable. So be assured that when you're falling, stumbling, or hurting, the Lord is watching you all the way. Amen? Amen? It's important for us to review a little bit. Now we're on the 14th chapter of the book of Leviticus. 
but it's probably going to be to mine and yours advantage to kind of review a little bit about what's going on. We have entered into the concept of leprosy. And leprosy is very controversial. Now, you might say, well, we talked about that. We did. We, I showed you Jennifer Lopez's feet in the dark. Um, I'm not going to show you again. You're just going to have to go to YouTube and look it out. But basically, we discovered that there's a consensus among theologians of modern times that um, leprosy in the Bible and leprosy of the modern times is is pretty much what we consider called Henson's disease. And Henson's disease is a nerve uh, damage type of disease. It's something that kind of uh, allows the person that's suffering from that disease to um, not feel pressure, to not feel pain. Some of us don't like to feel pain. Amen? And God is trying to rebalance uh, your perspective on pain. Only dead people don't feel pain. Amen? I've never heard any coroner complain about a customer in his shop. Okay? Uh, it just doesn't really happen that often. You hear other atrocious things but you never hear a customer uh, complain about the services he receives at a coroner's uh, service or some autopsy or something like that. Um, leprosy can be cured, and we looked at that, but that's modern day leprosy. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna challenge some of you because there is such a thing as biblical leprosy. Now, as a student, I'm a student, I love to research, I love to um, look at resources that not everybody looks at, um, and not everybody spends enough time. And the reason not everybody spends enough time doing that is because you got far too much greater things to take care of, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, like what your bunkie's doing, like what the neighbor's doing, like what your girlfriend's doing or your boyfriend's doing, like what the neighbor's doing or what, what team do you watch, Ken? Raiders. Lakers? Oh, Raiders. Raiders? Jerome, is that Raiders? No, it's Niners. Oh. See, some of us know more about our neighbor's business than our own. But I'm on a different team now, and you should thank the Lord that I am. Okay, because I don't watch soccer like they do. And um, I focus on things that are really life-changing for me. And I put up there on the screen two resources, two specific resources that I'm going to put up there for you, because one of you is going to challenge me on this, and I hope you do. Um, you're called to test all things according to what? Scripture. Scripture. And we're not called to follow men. Amen? Amen? And I teach the men here that the internet is not only good for pornography. Amen. So they, I, I try to teach them to balance their porn time and give God a third or at least a sixteenth. Okay? Give God a little bit of time. And this is a good way to do it. So I put the resources up there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you about biblical leprosy. And what, what happens is it kind of makes sense because we talked a lot about leprosy last Sunday. And this Sunday, what I want to do is I want to follow up on the story that we read in the book of Mark. Remember that story of the leper, the, 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 the man that had a real advanced skin disease. Or in his case, it was a real bad case of leprosy. The Bible teaches that in his case, there was no cure. There was absolutely no cure. And there was only one process known to the Jews 
of that time. And that was a, a process that involved God. There was no faking it there. Have you ever been in a situation where you call somebody else a fake? Well, there was no calling these people that were plagued with leprosy fakes. They were the real deal. And the only one that could cure them was God himself. And the interesting thing about it is, I don't know if you remember, but Jesus said, hey, keep it on the down low. In other words, the most amazing thing that could ever happen to an individual at that period of time happened to this guy, and this guy heard from the mouth of the one who healed him, hey, keep it on the down low. I mean, that's radical. I mean, that's like winning the lotto and keeping it to yourself. As much as you might want to keep it for me, because you know what I'm going to do, but um, <laughs> cash it in, no. Um, um, you know, I'm going to help you do the right thing. Now, you can ignore Pastor all you want. You, you, you know, some of us have a good history of that. But the reality is, if God knows all your sins, can you imagine that? God knows all your sins. Amen? Praise Jesus. That he stayed on the cross of Calvary until all your sins were placed on him. He didn't move. He didn't budge. He didn't say, no, I got to get off. I don't want that one. He waited for your sins and mine. Amen. Amen. So this is the same God that knows everything about you. This is the same God that knew the pain and the suffering that that man would endure all for the glory of God. But see, the reason Jesus told him not to go and talk about it is because there was a process involved for him to get the glory. There was a right way to do the right thing. And that's what we're here to do. We're reaching that moment in chapter 14 because chapter 14 outlines that process for biblical leprosy. Now there's a difference between biblical leprosy and Henson's disease, modern leprosy. And there's a history, there's a problem in understanding this, but I'll draw your attention to both the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, page 472, and the Biblical Leprosy uh, uh, Writings, that page 15, that is written by um, two people, actually it seems like a husband and wife team, um, the Cochrans, I think that's uh, Cochrane, um, that's the, the person who did the work. Now, these individuals outline the history of biblical leprosy and modern day leprosy. And they attribute all this to a well known person, uh, a father of ancient Christianity by the name of Jerome. Not you, Jerome, but the church father who translated. The Vulgate, which is the uh, Latin translation of uh, the Old Testament. Now, Jerome was born in on around 383 AD, and he was responsible for translating the Old Testament Hebrew word Sarat. Everybody say Sarat. I didn't say Sarah. I said Sarat. Now, that's that word that we get uh, that word leprosy from. And he was the one who translated that from the common or vulgar, uh, which is Latin tongue, uh, probably under the guidance of Constantine, the Roman emperor of his time. The, the translation is known to us as the Vulgate. And the Vulgate was the one that we see the evidence where this, this word was translated uh, from one language to another language, and it kind of took on a different meaning when it entered into 
a more modern interpretation. In other words, we all know that Henson's disease is curable. It's almost wiped out completely. And um, we saw the proof last time. But see, the disease that God is speaking of could only be healed by him and him only. No human being could ever heal that. Now, the evidence is such that um, it's, it's unique, and we'll, we'll see why. We, we saw the shadow of it last time because it was talking about how um, if you got it on clothes, if you got it on walls, if you got it on articles, it talked about how something was ceremoniously unclean. And that's different than a disease that can only be cured by God. There's a lot of symbolism in there. And I don't want you to miss it. What can only be cured by God? Sin. Amen. All of us are plagued with a sin issue. Amen. We need to see that God is so meticulous. He cares so much that he writes every jot and tittle of how you are to have a right relationship with him. And your angle and your history and who you think you are and your behavior has no bearing on the right way to approach him. There is only one way to be saved and that is through Jesus Christ amen. your salvation doesn't work amen? amen so this this person Jerome is uh, given a lot of credit for messing that up in that little area and it's actually uh, our fault you know we're lazy we don't look into the jots and the tittles of our relationship with God. Um, you know, if, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have spent the hours that it took for me to get to see that difference. But it makes sense now. You know, God is just showing his people how to um, have a healthier relationship with each other. Now remember, God instituted the first medical care service known to his people. Now how many people remember that these people were under uh, e Egyptian bondage for over 400 years? And you know, the Egyptians really didn't have a Medicare service for them. You know, it's like someone that tries to get help, you know, because they got a med medical condition and then they get kicked out because they don't have the credit or the money or the resources to get the help. That would be terrible for us. And, and we need to understand that God separated these people and said, look, I'm going to teach you how to take care of yourself, but it's going to have to happen my way. There was a lot of people out there that had diseases. As a matter of fact, there's no recording ever of any kind of cure except for in one place. And that place is in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 and 4. And right there we see the evidence of that moment where uh, Nam, who was a commander of the army of the king of Aram, he, he was a great man in the sight of his master, highly regarded, because through him, the Lord had given him victory to Aram. And he, he was a vi very uh, uh, victorious uh, soldier, and he had an issue. He had leprosy. And the strange thing about it is this story it tells us that he's given an odd way to cleanse himself and and it's done in a real a very interesting way i'm not going to talk 
too much about that story, but I'll encourage you to read it in your leisure. This morning, I do want to get into the book of Leviticus in the 14th chapter. So follow me there. Amen? Amen. The 14th chapter of the book of Leviticus. Starting in verse 1. Now, as normal, we've seen this pattern of introduction, and it hasn't changed much. We see a holy God speaking to people who are not yet holy, but are in the process of detox. God is saying, I am holy, so I'm calling you to be holy. And he has a method to this madness. Starting in verse 1, he says, The Lord said to Moses, Now how many people know that God had a right-hand man? And at this point, it was Moses. Amen? Amen? So he says, These are the regulations for the diseased person at the time of his ceremonial cleansing when he is brought to the priest. Now, remember, this is the ceremony for the cleansing. When he is brought to the priest. The priest is to go outside the camp and examine him. Now remember, we just heard how to approach this situation. And the situation calls for the high priest to go to him. Now, the reason the priest was to go to him was because he wasn't certified yet. And that's what the priest is for. The priest is for that certification process. Remember, nothing unclean could come in to the temple of God. Now, what does the Bible tell you about the temple of God now? James 4, 17. For those that know to do good and they don't do it, their issue is sin. The symbolism of leprosy is there. And only God paid the price. 1 John 1, 9 tells us, If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all your unrighteousness. Amen? God is the way. He's always been the way. The high priest, in this case, comes outside the camp. Jesus will meet you wherever you are at. No matter what you think, no matter how you feel, no matter how shameful you may feel, Jesus said he will never leave you and never forsake you. Amen? Amen? So the priest had a lot of roles. He had to go outside the camp to examine that person. And if the person has been healed of his infectious disease, skin disease, the priest shall order that two live clean birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the one to be cleansed. Now, it's interesting. So this would give us the idea that the priest was all up in your business. Amen. How many people like, Pastor, getting up all in your business? Remember, you're in a place that God's reminding you He knows all your thoughts. How many people at least know that you have to get used to God sending someone to you to encourage you in a way you may not think is encouraging? You are called to learn to love rebuke. It's a learning process. You're here to learn. If you came with a hard head, then that's why nothing's going in. Nothing's going out and nothing's going in. 
Remember, it's your hard head, not the person next to you. It's your hard heart. Amen? Amen. Don't blame it on them. Don't blame it on anybody else. You're called to examine yourself. Amen? Amen? So God always brings somebody next to you to encourage you. But that's not encouraging, Pastor. Yeah, it is. Remember, you're in the presence of God. You're the one that came to change. How many people have something that they got to change? Amen. Only God can help you in that area. Ignoring wise counsel is what got you here in the first place. So, it doesn't take much. You know, a little bird. Some of you may 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 uh, wonder why the cedar wood. You know, why the two birds, why the scarlet yarn, and hyssop. In all honesty, I can't and I have not gotten a resource that I would be able to honestly tell you that was sound enough. Nobody knows. Everybody can conject an idea. And uh, I, I even um, had somebody tell me or, or the resource uh, say that it's kind of a process that the priest would use. He would tie a string on there and use the oil and uh, create some kind of dabbing process. Why? He ain't trying to touch you. You know? He's not trying to get that close. Okay? Just close enough. You know, the oils are symbolic, okay? Oil, the anointing of the oil for us is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, amen? I'm just putting these ideas in your heart. We're called to test all things according to Scripture, amen? I'm going to start on verse 5. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed, over fresh water in a clay pot. He is then to take the live bird and dip it together with the cedar wood, the scarlet yarn, and the hyssop into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Now, I'm going to talk about that symbolism. Now, I know that sounds kind of freaky. But remember, what God is telling these people has to do with the time period that they lived in. And back then, they were into 11 shades of gray, or I don't know how many shades of gray. They were into freaky deaky stuff. Okay? God knows your freaky deaky stuff. Okay? You're not going to talk about it in public, but you know, you know what you guys talk about when you think Pastor's not listening. Okay? Somebody forgot I have a camera in my office. I'm just saying, if, if I can hear it and I start doing this, then, you know, just imagine. We just need to thank the Lord that the, the Bible teaches us to have compassion with one another. You know, I thank the Lord nobody can read my mind but him. Okay? You ain't got nothing on me. Now, why do I say that? Because I know me. I know me. I know my problems. And see, I believe that the reason, and it really, really spoke to me, is because, see, one of them speaks of the death that we live without Christ, and one of them speaks of the renewing of the mind, the, the, the symbolism of being reborn. You have a bird, one that dies, and one that lives because the blood covers and atones for the sins of that person. And it's an amazing concept that two birds, one dies, the other one lives. Now, it seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed 
of the infectious disease and pronounce him clean. Then he is to release the live bird in the open field. The person is to be cleansed, or the person to be cleansed must wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and bathe with water. Then he will be ceremonially clean. After this, he may come into the camp, but he must stay outside his tent for seven days. On the seventh day, he must shave off all of his hair. He must shave his head, his beard, his eyebrow, and his rest of his hair. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water, and he will be cleansed. Amen? Amen. I'm going to stop there for a second. There was, there was a story that I heard one time about, about a pastor. And this pastor, he, he was a pastor of a Baptist church. And, and um, see, back then, he couldn't make it with just one wage, so he had to get a job, and, and he was a barber. He, he had a barber shop, and he would cut hair. And he had a, he had a partner, and w one day, um, this, this real rich guy in his town um, uh, was waking up in the morning, and he was just about to shave, and he, and he gets a thought in his head, and he, and he looks at himself in the mirror, and he says, you know, what am I doing? I've got all this money, and what am I doing shaving myself? I want to go downtown, and I want to, I want to go to uh, Pastor Bob, and um, and I want to, I want to let him shave me because he has these towel thingies, you know, he gets hot towels and he puts it on his face. He sees that all the time, and since he makes a lot of money, he said, you know what? How much can that cost? I deserve that. I need to love on myself. He says, so. He decides to go on this very day and he goes to the barber and he says, hey, how much for a haircut? And uh, is, is Pastor Bob here? And Pastor Bob's partner was there. And Pastor Bob's partner was his wife. And his wife says, um, it costs $77. And the man says, whoa, that's kind of high. You know, but he said, well, I've got enough money. I need to love on myself. Amen? Some of us need to learn how to love on ourselves. $77 is not a bad price for, for a barber cut, right? All you barber wannabes, right? <laughs> That's our goal, you know? We want to promote from within. So, so the, the, the partner, his wife, whose name was Grace, um, she says, don't worry. I'm the one that does the shaving anyways. So I can do it for you. He's not here. And the guy says, okay, all right, no big deal. So he sits down and gets a shave and gets, gets a really neat experience. Everything he could imagine, the hot towel, the arom aromatic uh, infused aroma. The, he, she busted out with this pot of steam and she had a little kid fan it out like that you know and the little kid would come out and fan it out in a different direction so his pores would open and then close and then open and he just really had a real good experience so the next day he goes and and he wakes up in the morning and the first thing he does is he rubs his face and says wow man it's pretty good he felt really clean, really nice and done. He said, man, you know what? That $77, it's not bad. It goes throughout the whole day. And the very next day, he wakes up, and he goes in the morning, and he rubs his face again. And, and wow, it was completely soft. So he was like, wow, this is incredible. The next day, he woke up in a hurry and touched his face, same thing. He couldn't believe it. 
he he went back to the place and he he went to Pastor Bob and he says, you know what? That was the best shave I've ever had. It's been one week and it's still soft. How does she do it? And Bob said, hey, you got shaved by grace. Once shaved, always shaved. <laughs> Some of you might not get it until after you get shaved. <laughs> All right, here we go. In other words, hair was a symbol back then to, to the Jewish man. It was a symbol of, of maturity. It was a symbol of maturity. Um, there are stories in the Bible where, where some of God's men were shamed by um, the, the enemy uh, in such a way where they would shave them. And, and when a, a godly man was shaved, it, it made them look like an immature person. Some of us need to understand that the way we feel about maturing in Christ has to change because some of us are only mature in age, not in Christ. Right. Amen? Amen? Remember, this is about spiritual growth. And the next generation depends on your growth. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, so on the eighth day, I'm on verse 10, on the eighth day, he must bring two male lambs and one ooh lamb, a year old, that's what an ooh, ooh lamb is, each without defect, along with three-tenths of an ephah, of fine flour mixed with oil, for a grain offering and one log uh, of oil. That's a measure of oil. Very little bit of oil. Um, the priest who pronounces him clean shall present both the one to be cleansed and his offering before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then the priest is to take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering, along with the lug of oil. He shall wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. He is to slaughter the lamb in the holy place where the sin offering and the burnt offering are slaughtered. Like the sin offering, the guilt offering belongs to the priest, it is most holy. The priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed. On the thumb of his right hand and on the toe of his right foot. Now, this should echo to you because we talked about this before. The cleansing of, of what, you, what you handle. The cleansing of, of not only what you handle, what you listen to. Some of you that listen to things that you shouldn't listen to and handle things in a way you shouldn't handle them. And the toe speaks of your testimony. Where are you going? Where were you at? See, the priest shall then take some of the log of oil, pour it on the palm of his own left hand, then dip his right forefinger into the oil of his palm, and with his finger sprinkle some of it before the Lord seven times. The priest is to put some of the oil remaining in his palm on the lobe of his right ear of the one to be cleansed 
on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot on the top on the top of the blood of the guilt offering and the rest of the oil in his palm the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed and make an atonement for him, for, for him before the Lord then the priest is to sacrifice the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from the un, for his uncleanness. After that, the priest shall slaughter the burnt offering and offer it on the altar together with the grain offering and make atonement for him and he will be clean. Amen. Now, from verses 11 to verse 20 is one continuous sentence in the Hebrew. It's one continuous sentence in the Hebrew. And what it does is it gives us the process that Jesus was referring to in the book of Mark when he healed that man from his sickness. He told him, to go do the right thing. There's a right way to glorify God. People, you need to learn that God gave you those children. God gave you that wife. God gave you that significant person. God gave you your mother. God gave you your father. God gave you your children. God gave you your pastor. God gave you your enemy. God gave you them so you can do the right thing. Thing. And only he can direct every step in that process. His word is a lamp unto our feet. His word is what gives us salvation. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 21. If, however, he is poor and cannot afford these, he must take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for him together with the tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering a log of oil and two doves or two young pigeons which he can afford one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering on the eighth day, he must bring them for his cleansing to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. The priest is to take the lamb for the guilt offering together with the log of oil and the wave and wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. He shall slaughter the lamb for the guilt offering and take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest is to pour some of the oil into the palm of his own left hand and with his right finger sprinkle some of the oil from his palm seven times before the Lord. Some of the oil in his palm he must or he is to put on the same places he put the blood of the guilt offering on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of the right foot the rest of the oil in his palm the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord then he shall sacrifice the doves or the young pigeons which the person can afford. One as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to gather together with the grain offering. In this way the priest will make atonement before the Lord and on behalf of the one to be cleansed. These are the regulations for anyone who has an infectious disease and who cannot 
afford the regular offering for his cleansing. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When you enter the land of Canaan, which I am giving you as your possession, and I put a spreading mildew in your house in that land, the owner of the house must go and tell the priest. I have seen something that looks like mildew in my house. I'm going to stop there for a second. And I'm going to introduce uh, the idea of this word, this sarat, this uh, word in biblical Hebrew can mean mold and it can actually mean wood rot. In other words, um, God was looking after the, his people. He was looking after his people in such a way that he wanted to make sure that these people were safe. It actually includes, guess what? Bedbugs. Remember, we're talking about a surface issue. How many people know that in my experience, bedbugs happens to actually work for you instead of against you? You want to teach your kids how to keep their room clean? Give them bedbugs. I can't tell you how clean these men can be if you just put a very little motivation behind them. It's amazing. I've got people vacuuming two, three times in the middle of the day. You know, they're just vacuuming and vacuuming in the corners. They're cleaning the walls. They wash. They do all kinds of amazing. They even take showers once a day. It's amazing. Before, man, I had guys go weeks without doing that. Until people would say, hey, pastor, I can't take this anymore. Now it happens regularly. And it's amazing. They encourage each other. There's even a list. You know, it's amazing. I've never had it before. And when I did get it, I thought, oh, no, what am I going to do? But you know what? The problem fixed another problem. God's people are not going to lay around if they can't. And these little amazing creatures have been somewhat of a blessing to some people. I'm not saying to everybody, but you need to understand that God knows your weakness. God knows how to motivate you. Who would have thought a grown macho man would be brought down by a little, tiny, little bug like this and I can't tell you I've seen the biggest strongest big your dogs you know murderers killers gang members ruthless thugs you know be brought down to shame because of a little thing like that you know it's amazing you know um but, you know, I'm not going to talk anymore about Paul. Now, if you ever want to know if you had bed bugs, invite Paul. If he's a foot near any kind of infestation, he turns strawberry in color. He, he doesn't even have to go in there. You just throw a pillow with those next to him, and this guy has this reaction. You know, and it's just an amazing thing. He he thought one day I invited him to my house just to hang out. And it was, no, I just wanted to know if it was fleas or bed bugs. And, you know, when he didn't react, I was cool. I was like, it's just fleas, okay? He thought it was just because I wanted him to come to my house. But I have to be honest and tell you that. My goal is to try to get to finish some of this. But you know, there's, there's a lot of verses in this bad boy. There's 57 verses in this, so I'm halfway there. I've got one minute, and I'm not going to finish. Now, listen. 
I've given you enough information, and this this really my purpose of bringing you the the opposing view today of modern day leprosy and biblical leprosy is because I don't want you to think that skin disease is a punishment from God. Okay? That's not a punishment from God. And that's what happens when, when, when you believe in the wrong God, you might think the suffering that you're going through is because somehow He's disciplining you or punishing you or alienating you from His presence, and that's absolutely not true. Any kind of problem that you have on a physical level, it's probably because of something you had something to do with. And if it isn't, I guarantee you, the great physician can heal you. There's only one solution for biblical leprosy. And that is God. Now God can heal you of all your sins. He can, he can take away all your problems. He can give you a complete healing. But not in this dimension. Every day of your life, you are going to have a reason to depend on your Savior, Jesus. Every day of your life, you're going to be brought to humility. And that's the only thing that could happen when you remember whose presence you're in. As you go out throughout this week, I will encourage you, I will remind you just by my presence that God brought someone to your side to encourage you, to correct you if you need it, to pray with you if you desire it. But the rest is up to you. The Bible says he gave you his spirit as the earnest of your inheritance. Your body is his temple, which his spirit resides in. Amen? Amen. So don't let your emotions lie to you. Don't let the circumstances lie to you. But be led by the promises of the word of God, the Bible. Let's close with a word of prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, our Lord, our Savior, our Mishiach, our High Priest, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're able to speak into our lives in such an intimate way, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you gave us the solution for all of our problems, both in the past, both the present ones, and the ones yet to come, Lord. Lord, you are the ultimate solution. Irregardless of our emotions, irregardless of our futile thinking, Lord, we thank you for the loved one that we have next to us. We know that you brought them for us to love them, for us to show them grace, forgiveness, just like you have shown us, Lord. We thank you for your grace upon our lives. And we thank you this very minute for your mercy upon our very lives. Heavenly Father, help us through your spirit be reminded that we are to be an example to others that offend us. That pride is not something that we want to pray about. It's not an attribute that you have, but it's an, an attitude that we need to disregard. Lord, I especially pray for uh, the birthday boy today. I, I thank you, Lord, that you gave us Gilbert as a gift and on his his birthday today Lord we pray a special blessing upon his life and Lord we thank you that you brought his gentle spirit back to us Lord we thank you 
for the new men that came into the program. We thank you for both, uh, actually all four new men, even though the two that left were for a short visit. We know that your spirit is with them, Lord. We pray a special blessing upon them as well. Lord, we pray that those who have been challenged in your presence depend on your leadership ultimately. One that is led with the example of humility. Lord, I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for your forgiveness. And give us traveling mercy as we go throughout the week in your image. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen, amen, amen. Go in peace.